right, so I'm here talking to Tony Morrill. Did I get that right, Tony? Is it Tony Morrill, or is it, as we would say here in Canada, Tony Morrill? No, you got it right. It's uh, moral as in uh, moral of the story. That's how I tell people. So. And here's a segue that you can only get on the other side of truth. What is the moral of the story? Which is to say, what is Tony Morrill's story? I am a blogger uh, who talks about paranormal and Fortean topics with all of the expertise of a person that's been reading about it for 10 years. So I guess it counts for nothing. But, you know, I'm interested in the crazy stuff and I like to read about crazy stuff and talk to people about crazy things. So You have a blog called Fortiania. I was going to say yes, Fortiana, similar, but it's Fortiania, <laughs> which um, I'll put a link up on my, uh, on my website for the show and everything else. And it says underneath, blog about all things Fortian, news, reviews, and info will follow daily, which it doesn't anymore, or, or semi-daily, which it does. It does. It's uh, 25. I don't mind uh, and, uh, going on the record. Topics. So. Um, how did you get interested in Fortiana? Because you often hear older people in the UFO world or the ghost hunting world or, or anything to do with the world of the weird and the wacky bemoaning the fact that very few young people seem to be interested in the subject anymore. So you're a young person. I'm going to go directly to the source and ask, how did you get interested in all this crazy stuff? Well, I've always been a pretty avid reader, um, even when I was, I guess, much younger than I am now. And uh, I read a lot of science topics, a lot of astronomy and space books and stuff when I was a young child. And um, I was pretty well convinced at the ripe old age of eight that I had everything figured out pretty well and that there could be uh, – there was probably no life elsewhere in the universe and the UFOs were just all swamp gas or you know Venus or anything like that. And uh, I went around professing this. You know, Again, I'm eight years old and I'm professing that I know everything. And my mom overhears me one day, and um, she says something to the effect of, well, you know, why would there be all these billions of stars and billions of galaxies and universes that are likely out there, but life only on one tiny little speck out in the middle of nowhere? And uh, I was pretty flabbergasted. <laughs> you know, at eight years old, I'm like, wow, I guess I don't know everything. Are they coming for you or me? Sorry, that's a Greg Bishop moment. Anybody who listens to Radio Mysterioso knows that if you're in studio with Greg, you'll always hear a siren. And the same thing, there's been murders around my neighborhood lately here in Halifax. So the same thing is, yeah, they're probably, I don't know, that my neighbor's probably been shot. So there you go, a little, uh, little Radio Mysterioso moment for it. So uh, continue on. Your mom is clearly a strange woman or was a clearly a strange woman who inculcated in a very young age values that most parents would find reprehensible in her child so um, which is clear thinking apparently I, I think she's come to regret that a little bit um as you know my life's turned out and i uh got a little bit obsessed with that but that's a little later on down the road but anyway so she's she's got me convinced that you know perhaps maybe i don't know everything and that there might be more to this than i had originally suspected and I just started picking up books on UFOs. I think one of my first ones was by um, Michael Lindemann, The Six Viewpoints on the UFO Phenomena, or something to that effect. And it had interviews with you know, Stanton Friedman, which I know you know who he is, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, I think Tim Good was in there maybe, and a couple other people. And it was – oh, and Bob Lazar and George Knapp, which was fascinating at the age of 10 to read those kind of stories. And so pretty early on, I, I got – hooked into the UFO thing and I bought it, you know, pretty hook, line and sinker, the, what I would consider the mainline UFO, uh, theory, the Roswell crash in 47 was aliens from Zeta Reticula and, you know, that whole shebang, I bought that pretty well. And, uh, it followed after that, that my grandmother would take me to the bookstore to buy these books, uh, when I would go to, to hang out with her. I guess I was really lucky now that I think about it, that I had, you know, family that was encouraging of, my weirdness. And uh, one day I went to the magazine rack and I saw this strange magazine called uh, 40 and Times. And I picked it up and it was very British, which was weird for me at a young age because, you know, the the uh, words were misspelled, uh, as I still am convinced they're misspelled, you know, color and favorite and stuff like that. Uh, so I was introduced to this this whole wider, you know, 40 and world because I guess I figured that if, you know, UFOs could happen and aliens were possible, why, you know, why stop there? Why not psychic phenomena and ghosts and uh, spontaneous human combustion and all kinds of things? I actually remember that the first issue of 40 and Times I picked up had the, 
what do they call them, the moving coffins or Barbados, where this uh, rich family's crypt had the coffins that every year they'd come back and bury somebody. These really heavy cement coffins would be thrown about all over the place, and nobody had any idea what was going on, and they still don't really know uh, what was happening. But it, it really blew my mind that people were talking about these things in a relatively serious fashion, because the Fortean Times, I don't know, they've always kind of had a tongue-in-cheek approach to it, I guess, but that was basically my overall introduction to this whole wide world of weirdness. Yeah, the 40 in Times, very British sort of magazine. It is a different sensibility, even than the Canadian sensibility. You know, anybody who's familiar with the Monty Python type of humor, that's the way that the British in general, I mean, it's a stereotype, but in general, they have a different way of looking at, well, everything, but the paranormal in particular. And I'm lucky enough to have friends in both the United States, but also in the United Kingdom in the paranormal world, if you will. And they, they do have a different they do have a different attitude and it does show up. You can see it very clearly in the difference between a magazine like the Forty and Times, for instance, in the United Kingdom, and say the more popular magazine in the United States, UFO magazine, which there's very little similarity between the two of them, even though they're both talking about the same general subject. Right, right. And that was another early magazine that got introduced to the UFO magazine. And yeah, like you said, it's, it's a different approach to a fair, what I consider a fairly similar topic. Um, whereas the UFO magazine definitely tried, at least when I you know read it back then, I haven't read it in a while, but when I read it back then, it was definitely trying to be more scientific in its approach to the phenomena and trying to be very serious, almost, and I'm using the term loosely, but almost scholarly approach, I guess, to the to the topic. I don't know whether it succeeded in that or not, but it, it certainly seemed like that's what they were trying to go for. Yeah, scholarly is a relative term. I guess in the UFO field, maybe scholarly, but if you wanted a scholarly magazine, the International UFO Reporter was probably, which QFOS put out, um, was probably the was closest to scholarly. Um, UFO magazine, it was more, quote, quote, scholarly then than it, than it certainly is now. But, you know, it's the difference between British and American culture. They're more interested in the, in the folkloric aspect of it, um, which probably makes sense on an island where they, at least some people, if you go to the right pub at the right time of night, still think dragons exist. <laughs> or, you know, or, <laughs> right. the, or if you go to the United States, where conversely, um, everybody seems to think that technology can solve all of your problems. So there is a cultural difference there, and it does manifest itself in a lot of different places. You have Madonna, they have the Spice Girls, and on and on and on. But it does in the Fortean world, too. So your parents, or your mom in particular, at the age of 10, was encouraging you, or at least allowing you to read Bob Lazar and, uh, and George Knapp. It's amazing. it's amazing you haven't grown up to become a serial killer. <laughs> you know, I've, I've often thought that myself. Um, no, luckily... She didn't, I guess, go through the books thoroughly. She sort of just read the back and saw that it was UFOs and stuff like that. And it seemed, and, you know, I guess this is a relative term, uh, innocent at the time. And so she wasn't too concerned about it. And, uh, you know, since I was a, I was a pretty good kid, you know, I, I didn't uh, get into a lot of trouble and I did okay in school. I, I don't think she thought it was that big a deal um, that I was reading these kind of topics. It wasn't until... In high school, when I got into what she considered the bad crowd and stuff like that, that it became an issue. And um, what we used to term the books, that would be my collection of all these strange and unusual books, became a, a point of contention between she and I for a while, where it got to the point she was so concerned with my, what she felt was obsession with, you know, the paranormal, that she actually took the books from me for a, for a time. She felt that I wasn't, I don't know, that I had an unhealthy you know, I guess obsession really isn't the only word for it. Uh, words on topic. So, she, and I, I'm, I'm glad she did that. I, I did need some perspective, and I was, you know, I was young, but I, I needed to focus on, you know, school and stuff like that. So. And then you discovered girls, and everything changed. Yes, uh, they didn't discover me, unfortunately, but I, I, did, <laughs> I did discover them. <laughs> I got news for you, Tony. The truth is, even with if you're with them, they never really discover you, and you're never really going to discover them. Hence the men are from Mars and women are from Venus thing, which makes me wonder how the races on those two planets survive. Because if you didn't have any men on Venus and you didn't have any women on Mars, that might explain why there's no more Martians and no more Venusians. 
<laughs> That's true. I assume it was uh, asexual reproduction for a while, which may be why they wanted to stop living, because that doesn't sound like fun to me. So, See, you you clearly have, yes, been reading far too much of this stuff from a young age, where you can just <laughs> drop at the, you know, like, boom, sounds like asexual reproduction to me. That's very, <laughs> it's very Mac Tony's of you. That's the kind of thing he would have just, hey, yeah, that sounds like asexual reproduction. Yes. Really? Oh, I hadn't never thought of it that way. So you have, and before we get into some of this stuff, I just want to point out a couple of things. On your Facebook badge page on your blog, your email is Count Ducula 24 Now I'm going to assume that means there were 23 other Count Duculas before you got around to um, getting a Gmail address. Is that true, or was that your age at the time? Well, no, it's actually a combination of two things. There, Count Ducula was taken uh, for Gmail, even though I was one of the early, you know, when you had to get an invite for Gmail. Um, I got in pretty early, but there were still already Count Duculas. But 24 is my date of birth, so it was easy to remember. And I would presume that you're a Count Ducula fan. I I think that show tells a lot about me if you're familiar with it, as I'm sure you may be. But, uh, you know, when you have a vampire duck who is a vegetarian, as opposed to being a, uh, a bloodsucker that vampires normally are, I, I, I really liked that kind of comedic style i guess and that was also a british there was a subversive element running through it and you you know you just hit on it you've got a vampire duck who's a vegetarian uh, that's a little weird um so that might explain actually why i hooked up with zorgrot the space alien duck because i too was a count duckula fan so i don't meet too many people that are either familiar with the show or were fans of it if they are familiar with it so that's it's always nice to meet a fellow count duckula fan the other thing i noticed on your facebook badge by the way uh, that i was going to mention quickly is your status says, watching aliens on Sci-Fi Channel in preparation. When I was growing up, there was no Sci-Fi Channel, of course. We, in Canada, we had the CBC, and then I think we had the Emergency Broadcast Channel, which was always a lot of fun, because, you know, you could just watch it and, and wait for nuclear war, which your generation didn't really have to worry about, but mine did. But your generation grew up watching aliens on the Sci-Fi Channel, and all that sort of stuff. So did that have an influence on you as well, the ability to kind of tune into sci-fi or even the History Channel and watch something like, I don't know if it was UFO Hunters or whatever show they might have had on back then. I think it did. I think it did. Because when I was younger, a lot of the times I would watch Discovery Channel, History Channel, the Learning Channel back before it became solely about reality TV. And, you know, every now and then they would have these documentaries on the abduction phenomena and the UFO phenomena and, you know, strange earth mysteries and stuff like that. And it was really cool because, you know, occasionally I could catch reruns of something like In Search Of, but that was obviously before, you know, my time. And Unsolved Mysteries had sort of gone off the air as well. So all I was left with were those kind of documentaries. And they did they did shape that. And it was, it was really cool because I didn't have the internet as a child, so I didn't have that access to that resource. So when I wanted to learn information, I'd either have to wait to go to the bookstore or I, I was lucky enough to catch a documentary on TV, which I, I really do think, you know, helped shape a lot of the um, my mainline theories that I used to have. Tony Morrill, no Internet as a child. Wow. Rocking it old school. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Rocking it 20th century. Very good. You didn't have the Internet as a child. I didn't have a computer. Well, we did. We eventually got a Commodore VIC-20 which anybody who knows what a Commodore VIC-20 was. It was cutting edge in 1984 or whenever we had it. But your video game consisted of a keyboard where you'd press two little keys and a skier would slide down a hill. And if you went left, <laughs> he went left, and you tried not to hit a tree. And we all thought, wow, this is awesome. This is clearly Star Trek. Technology can never, ever get any better than this. We, we might as well, this is the end of history. And then, of course, we were, we were not right. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better... My first access to a computer in the home was a word processor. So, you know, it wasn't exactly cutting edge either. So. Well, it's more cutting edge than a Commodore VIC-20, but still, you know, not quite as cutting edge as an iPad or whatever the kids have today. Right. I, I actually, one of the things that Mac Tonys and I always like talking about was the idea of post-humanism or transhumanism. And that idea that someday, relatively soon perhaps, we might actually become cyborgs, if you will, or merge with our technology in some way in fact we're actually merging with we've been merging with our technology for a very long time since you know artificial limbs even back during the days of the first world war came in but uh, certainly since artificial hearts and stuff i don't think we really realized it but that 
kind of leads me to an interesting thread that I'd like to ask you about, which is how much of that stuff do you follow? Does that stuff kind of interest you? And do you think when you're looking at UFOs, do you look at the alien thing, perhaps, the that idea of aliens, and wonder, are these flesh and blood creatures that we might be dealing with if we are dealing with something from another planet? Or if you look at our own potential future down the road, might we be dealing with some form of artificial life, whether um, robots or AI or cyborgs like the Cylons or whatever? Does that, does that kind of stuff creep into your thinking? It does. It does. I didn't I don't follow it as closely as, um, you know, Mac did, I imagine. But I am fascinated by it. And I I think maybe second or third generation, I would totally sign up for a brain implant that would allow me to connect with my computer. Not first generation, but maybe third generation. And as far as, you know, what that may mean towards the UFO phenomenon, I can't help but imagine that it's certainly worth investigating. I've looked at, uh, or I remember hearing about cases where during a supposed alien abduction scenario, if anything on the human side is different than what the so-called grays are used to, it's as if they don't know how to react. Like their program is messed up because they're used to it happening in a certain sequence of events, which sounds a lot like a computer program that's running. And so I wonder sometimes if, you know, UFOs aren't something that some ancient creator set up eons ago and is still running out its programming, and we're just happen to be at a point now where we can recognize it and interact with it. You know, it's not anything that I've concretely set down, but I do find myself wondering that sometimes. Well, let's circle back there for a second and look at the alien abduction thing for just a minute from that perspective, because you've written about alien abductions, and I'm curious what you think of them. Because if you look at most of the abduction accounts, it's certainly through the modern Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs meme, what you tend to get are people taking you, people, creatures taking you up to a ship, and it kind of looks like a souped up operating room. Does that make sense to you? Just that way that it has been presented, that you would have these creatures who could fly from other planets, fly, travel from other planets, with technology that would obviously be far in advance of ours, and yet they're still using the same kind of medical equipment that we're using. Does that seem to fit? No, it doesn't. And that was actually one of the first things that started to bother me when I uh, began to explore outside of the mainline ETH as the only explanation for the UFO phenomena. The abduction part of it, if there is any correlation between the UFO phenomena and the abduction phenomena, but that's a whole other can of worms. But just looking at the abduction phenomena as it is, it did sort of bother me that these creatures were teleporting people, well, you know, using the word teleport, I don't know, taking people through walls, you know, solid walls, but then putting them on a, what amounts to a stretcher or a gurney and cutting them up with needles or using syringes to take out blood samples and things like those two things didn't, those don't seem to jive very well for me. I, I don't understand how a species that's able to, assuming they're not from around here, come millions of light years away Uh, take you through your wall, literally, you know, like, I don't know how they would do that, obviously, but then just lay you down on a table and start inserting needles to get amniotic fluid out. That doesn't seem to work for me. Yeah, it's kind of like a guy who gets pulled over by the police for talking on his super cell phone or his um, whatever these, well, I'll just say cell phone, whatever, the most advanced cell phone you have, but he's been pulled over for while driving, but he's been driving, he's driving a Flintstone mobile. So yes. he's got his little feet moving. So, yeah, you've got the super cell phone. You've got the ultimate in technology. Meanwhile, driving a Flintstone mobile. Never, never do. Flintstones, meet the Flintstones. They're the Montessori family. From the town of Red Rock, they're a place right out of history. That's right. So if you are a little leery now of the extraterrestrial Zeta Reticulin meme, what do you think of UFOs? Let's dig down, let's drill down, as the kids say, into what Tony Morrill, or as we French-Canadians say, Tony Morrill, with a U, 
Tony Morel. What do you what do you make of the whole UFO thing? Where has your journey led you? What conclusions have you come to, if you've come to any? And I'm going to toss in two because I noticed your most recent column says demonic UFOs. Perhaps you could talk a bit about that column. And I see names like Jacques Vallée and John Keel and Mac Tony's popping up. So where has your thinking gone on UFOs over the last few years? It definitely moved away relatively quickly from the ETH strictly thing. It's it's funny that you know just even just a few years ago, I would say maybe 2006, 2007. I would have said that a UFO is an alien spaceship. And now if I hear someone else making that same kind of assumption, I'm very indignant about it, which is, I guess, kind of funny. But I, I don't forgive very easily of other people's uh, faults that I would forgive my own. But it's so hard to come to any kind of real conclusion on the phenomena. What I can say is this. I don't think there's any one answer. And I think that may be the best answer that anyone can give. If you were to rule out misidentifications of known craft and things like that, you you still seem to be dealing with a very unusual phenomenon that we don't seem to be able to explain necessarily. I liked Mac's uh, crypto-terrestrial theory, obviously. I, I, I enjoy that. Uh, it's kind of fun to play with the idea that there are, among us perhaps, it, you know, an indigenous species that lives here that could rig up you know, lights in the sky that, that appear to be these super amazing craft that are in fact uh, maybe nothing more than fancy weather balloons. I, I, I like that as an, as an idea. I don't know that that's what's necessarily going on, but I do enjoy it. I think it's a little bit of everything. I think they're, given the vastness of the universe and how much life is probably out there, I don't think it's a stretch to say that we have been visited by extraterrestrials. Uh, I don't think that they're the ones behind the abduction phenomenon, and I don't think that they're the ones that people are meeting in their fields and, you know, going for rides around Venus in. I, I don't think that that's what's happening in those cases. I think it may be much more at home. And uh, as far as Jacques Vallée and John Keel go, those were two researchers that I was introduced to through the Tim Benall's uh, Benal of America show. When I first heard their ideas, I was I guess indignant would be a good word for it. I was very indignant that they could dare to to uh, to decry the the ETH because uh, it seemed to make the most sense at the time. But I, as I read Jacques Vallée's you know works and John Keel's works, I began to see that there doesn't seem to be as much of a nuts and bolts aspect to all of the phenomena. Certainly, maybe some of it, but not maybe not all of it. Um, I think. What is it? Jacques Vallée said that uh, as Americans, we like to kick the tires, I think. Right. We like it to be a more physical phenomenon because that's a little bit easier to to wrap our heads around. But I I don't think that that necessarily jives with all the data that we seem to have. And uh, as far as that most recent post, the demonic UFOs, that was that was fun. I almost didn't post that one, actually, to be perfectly honest with you. As, As you know, I sometimes spend a little too much time on above top secret forums. They, they do occasionally have interesting, at least, ideas. They can jumpstart my you know, thought process, even if I don't necessarily agree with the person that posted, which in this case I don't. Um, this guy, I can't think of what his handle was, but he essentially laid out all these really great quotes by people like Jacques Vallée, uh, John Keel, uh, Paul Davies, and a couple other people. These really great, we don't think it's E.T. quotes about the UFO phenomena. And... I was on board, you know, for the the majority of the post. I was like, okay, cool. I, I like where this guy's going. I obviously I'm I'm with him, so it was a you know confirmation bias thing. So I was like, well, of course he's right because he agrees with me. And then it got to the bottom where he essentially laid out what he says we know for a fact about the alien abduction UFO phenomena. And it's this huge list of very evangelical Christian ideals about the phenomena. All aliens are demons. Uh, all aliens are here to turn us away from God and to, to lead us towards damnation. And all abductions can stop when you call out in the name of Christ. And all this other stuff that I I haven't seen the data to support. So I wasn't sure. But it was in the back of my mind and I wasn't, I wasn't going to post about it because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it because I, I do try to be even-handed about the topics, even if I don't necessarily agree with what I'm 
trying to bring to other people's attention, I do want to try to be as even handed about it as possible because I really don't know. Obviously, I have suspicions about the UFO phenomena, but I don't really know. And I can never say it's not this or it's not that, except in this case, I can say I'm pretty confident it's not demons, but I leave the door open. But when I was in the bookstore, I was flipping through some you know books that I was interested in getting, and one of them was Phil and Brogno's Ultra Terrestrial Contact. Given all of the shenanigans that happened last year, all of that aside, I, I kind of agree with Greg Bishop when he's like, even if all that stuff happened and it's true, he still had some interesting ideas. And I like that. You know, you don't have to throw the ideas out even if you throw the person out necessarily. For folks who might not know what we're talking about, Philip Imbrogno was a longtime uh, UFO researcher that I frankly had never really heard of, but a lot of people thought highly of. And uh, last year, and he, you know, said he was had a PhD from M MIT and a bunch of other stuff. And last year, a fellow named Lance Moody did a little basic research and discovered that almost everything Phil Imbrogno said, or maybe everything he said about his, his background, was, um, what's the word, what's the word? Oh, a lie. That's the word. So, I, wait, that's two words. It's a preposition in a word, which is two words. Anyway, so that's that for folks who are wondering, Imbrogno had written a bunch of books and um, been on a bunch of documentaries and stuff. Nobody apparently had ever checked his background, which is interesting. And, yeah, so he was shown to be a fraud personally. And what you're talking about is, well, just because a guy is a liar and a fraud doesn't mean that he didn't have some interesting ideas. Right, and it's that whole a broken clock can be right twice a day kind of idea, I guess. Because even John Keel, I think most people would admit he may have embellished a lot of his stuff. But that doesn't change that he had some interesting ideas. But, you know, all of that aside, I was slipping through the ultra terrestrial contact when I came upon this little slip of paper. And it had the stereotypical gray alien face with one of those no slashes through it. And it said something like, abductions are felonies, uh, deny... Oh, I can't remember now, but it was something to the effect of, of deny the lie, visit this website to learn the truth and everything like that. And I said, well, you know, this is kind of weird and a little bit synchronistic because uh, I've just been looking at this aliens as demons, you know, topic not two days before. And then here's this little piece of paper in a book that I happened to pull out. And I, then I got to wondering, I'm like, well, maybe it's not synchronicity, maybe someone wasted their time and, and put the slip of paper in every single book in the UFO section at my bookstore. They didn't, they only ended up putting it in uh, three or four different books, none of which I would have picked. I mean, I, they left Stan Romanek's book alone, uh, messages from whatever it's called. They left Whitley Strieber's communion alone, which I would have put one in. They picked very weird books, but anyway, I ended up finding four other ones and I figured that, you know, maybe I should write this topic or this post about the idea that demons that aliens are demons, because I had read uh, Nick Redfern's uh, Final Events last year, and it dealt with a similar idea that this group of government officials that was an official government group, if that makes any sense, uh, called the Collins Elite, had, after studying the phenomena, sort of come to the same kind of conclusion that what we were dealing with in the alien phenomena, uh, the UFO phenomena, the alien abduction phenomena, were in fact demonic spirits that were trying to turn humanity towards evil in an effort to harness our soul energy for some some kind of weird i don't know but i like to entertain weird ideas and so i put it out there and i put a lot of caveats i said i don't necessarily agree with this and i don't know you know what i mean and uh, it's funny because i was talking to my girlfriend about it as i posted it i said that i don't think this is going to go over very well uh, I didn't like the post. I didn't think that people were going to respond to it in a very positive light, but I was pleasantly surprised. Most of the feedback has been pretty positive, even from people that do prescribe to that theory that aliens are demons, which I, mean, I can't say they're not, but I don't think they are. You know what I mean? You actually, I quite like the post. And for folks, like I said, I'll put a link up to uh, Tony's blog, but I'll also put up a, a link to this particular post, although you should read all the posts. They're all very interesting. But it's one on June 5th called Demonic UFOs. And uh, what the gray thing, you actually posted a picture of the gray piece of paper, and it says, abduction with a little alien head, a felony, say no in big letters, N-O, to deceptive alien entities www.delusionresistance.org. Be warned, spread the word. 
So um, apparently they're spreading the word, but not in Whitley Strieber's book. Right. But in your post, you have a classic quote from Charles Fort, which takes us sort of back to the Fortean thing in your mm-hmm. in your Fortiania title. It says, quote, the earth is a farm. We are someone else's property, end quote. I find I found Nick's book fascinating. I mean, I, I have to say Nick's a very good friend of mine. I don't think it was one of his best written books, and I might have told him that, but I think it has some very interesting information in the sense that if you if you just kind of it makes you think we've got this UFO thing or any modern paranormal thing, if you will. Is this something new? Did it just pop up in 1947? Did the aliens, as perhaps Stan Friedman would suggest, see nuclear tests, V2 rockets and radar and decide, hey, these folks might be in space soon? You can tell I've talked to Stan a lot over the years because I sound like him now. You know, there were three things in um, in, in the late 1940s, V2 rockets, advanced radar systems, and uh, atomic weapons. And it's no coincidence that you could find all three of them in the New Mexico desert in 1947. That's actually, I think that's the exact phrase he said on every podcast I've ever heard him on. Um, well, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> you know, 20 family reunions later, I, I pretty much know the shtick. So, you know, that's one possibility, I suppose. The other possibility is that this, if there is anything to it at all, that this might have been something that's been with us for hundreds or thousands of years, or even, you know, far beyond that for the all of Earth's history, quote, quote, which leads into the crypto terrestrial thing, perhaps. But if that's the case, then what are demons? The term demon and that whole idea might just be a way that our ancestors hundreds or thousands of years ago used to describe something that they didn't understand because it fit within their more limited technological view, if you will. Mm -hmm. Whereas we, in a more technologically advanced society, now tend to assign, particularly in the United States, a technological explanation for it, which is, well, you know, we don't really buy demons anymore. That's kind of old school, but it's aliens from another planet. Do you think perhaps that's just a different way of saying the same general thing, something we don't know, and we put a a name to it that fits the cultural meme of our time? Yes, absolutely. That is kind of where I'm at in this whole I don't know, phenomena, enigma thing is that whatever we're dealing with, we've called by many, many different names. And I think that one of the posters I I responded to, and I said something to to that effect, I said that, you know, we're trapped in our cultural baggage, that I didn't like the term demon only because it has a certain connotation, you know, depending upon who you say it to, they're going to interpret it a certain way. But I don't, I don't mind, you know, saying demon instead of alien in like a loose, you know, loose terminology for just a non-human something. And I think even in the post, I I mentioned something to that effect about I prefer non-human intelligence, I guess, really, uh, as a catch-all. But, you know, maybe I'm just playing semantics, I guess, at that point. In the late night, certainly throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s, um, with shows like The X-Files, but also films like the E.T., The Extraterrestrial, even going back to the Star Wars, Star Trek generation, very much a science fiction thing, very much aliens on our mind, if you will. And then now when I look at what's coming out there, sure, there are still films about extraterrestrials, very little television about extraterrestrials. But what you do have, and maybe Buffy the Vampire Slayer was the shifting point where you had hell spawns and demons and everything. Now it seems kids are growing up and it's vampires and werewolves. Now you've got kids going, hey, conspiracies and aliens abducting people and extraterrestrials, boring. What's interesting, you know, what is new is old and what is old is new. Vampires are awesome, especially sparkly ones. Yeah, sparkly vampires, which could be alien vampires. You never know. Sparkly ones, right? You know, shows like Charmed. I mean, you can go on television and you can probably turn your TV on and at any given time on any given day, you can find a show dealing with the supernatural. Not the extraterrestrial version, but the very Earth-centered version. It makes me wonder, because it seems like the extraterrestrial thing has fallen out of fashion, even within ufology, except for the old school guys. And people are looking, hey, we need, you know, it's kind of dull and boring, which I find fascinating, because you know what? The idea of traveling between the stars and other civilizations that are not human living out there, I don't see how you can find that dull, but apparently people do. And what is more fascinating now to younger people seems to be, hey, it's really cool. It could be vampires. 
And I'm wondering if that's just part and parcel of who your generation is, and in 10 years they might be back to the extraterrestrial thing again. I have to wonder that that maybe it is that. I'm still old enough to remember when X-Files first came out, and that was definitely more of a, I guess, the old line way of thinking that it was aliens from another planet, although they did explore some very interesting topics. Uh, I think one of my favorite episodes was, I can't remember the title, but essentially it, it ripped off of a, kind of the Carl Jungian approach where it opens with a classic abduction scenario of two little greys abducting a couple, you know, at makeout point. And then the and then the two greys themselves get abducted by an even larger alien. But it was, it was interesting because it, it looked at it from less of a straight ETH approach and, and more of a, we're not really sure what happened approach, but I did like the nod towards the my lab, the, the military abduction aspect, where it was Air Force people abducting the, the kids at first, who then were also abducted by the aliens on top of that, which I thought was kind of interesting. But as far as the idea that we're looking more down to Earth than we are out into the stars for the answer, uh, there's a show that's still out there now, uh, Supernatural, ironically enough, um, on the CW here in the States. And it's two brothers, and they go and, and they they fight monsters, uh, vampires and werewolves and, and zombies and all kinds of other things. And one of their early episodes, they have a UFO that comes down and seems to abduct somebody, but they both laugh it off because they don't believe in aliens. I mean, they're out every day fighting vampires and werewolves, but aliens, that's just too much for them. And I thought that was kind of strange at first. I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can you be okay with vampires, but... But aliens are right out the window. But they did later on treat the UFO phenomena in a very – what I felt was a positive light. It appeared to be UFOs that were abducting people, but it turned out to be the fener- uh, fairy phenomena. Fairies were still kidnapping people and, and things like that, which I thought was really cool. That's a very you know Jacques Vallée kind of Mag- Magonia look at it. I've had the same thing because I went into, as you probably know – quote, quote, ghost hunting or ghost investigating uh, when I did my show Ghost Cases a couple of years ago. And so I've spoken at conferences about both. You know, I've kind of, I did one last year in November at HalCon, which is a science fiction convention here in Halifax. So there was, I'm in this packed room of about 100 people. And I'm, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm here to talk about the paranormal. And I have UFOs to talk about. I'm going to talk about some UFOs. And I was also going to talk about ghosts. I wound up talking solely about ghosts because it just seemed to be what people wanted to talk about. But afterwards, I was talking to a few people and all these people who were you know, really into ghost hunters and all this ghost stuff, they thought the UFO thing was crazy. They said, oh, well, that's nuts. But ghosts, that's completely sane. And I've met people in the UFO world who say, well, extraterrestrials, UFOs, well, that's clearly sane, but ghosts... Ah, that's that's mythology. That's craziness. And I just thought, you know what? I'd like to put you two groups of people in the same room, lock the door, and leave you there for a week without food. <laughs> and see what happens. And just, <laughs> yeah, just sort of see what happens. Because can you hear yourself talking? You're talking about ghosts, and you're talking about UFOs, and each of you think the other one is crazy. Whereas most people out in the regular world think you're all crazy. It is very odd, you know, the way that the, the different sort of – and the Bigfoot people – you will find people who will say Bigfoot is clearly normal, but UFOs are not. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, you're all understand it's all generally weird folks and don't judge people who might be interested in another aspect of the weirdness or the Fortiania, if you will. Yeah. Well, there does seem to be a lot of specialization within the general paranormal uh, quote unquote field. You rarely see people crossing over from the UFO aspect to the, you know, paranormal aspect, which, you know, when I say that, I mean ghosts and psychics, even though they're all the same thing in my mind. There's that cultural baggage with the terminology again. Even though you've got instances where families have been abducted and then experience poltergeist phenomena. Right. And... I can't say that there's a correlation directly with those things, but at the same time, we can't rule it out either because we don't have enough data on either aspect of what's going on to say that there is no correlation there. We don't know. And I heard – I don't remember where I heard it, but somebody was supposing that maybe 
the technology that the extraterrestrials use when they land would literally rip a hole in reality and that somehow spawned ghosts. Maybe, I don't know, but at least they were thinking, you know what I mean? And I appreciated that. Well, in a sense, I think a lot of it is science fiction um, or fantasy in the sense that we, you know, you really, generally speaking, you have people talking about these subjects. I'm one of them. You're one of them. I think we're all one of them. I mean, we're not experts. There's no such thing as an expert. So I'm not saying it's fiction. Absolutely, I'm not saying it's fiction. But to me, it's kind of like not religion, but called spirituality or the idea of God or whatever. Uh, we don't really know. I'm an agnostic. So, But it's fun to talk about over a beer. And the stories are interesting. And when you start hearing enough stories, you go, hey, maybe there's actually something to this. And now let's start talking about what that something might be. And that's where the real interest for me lies. It's kind of like sitting down over beer and trying to decide whether Ted Williams or Joe DiMaggio is a better baseball player. Let's have the argument. So Ted Williams can be the extraterrestrial hypothesis and Joe DiMaggio can be the interdimensional hypothesis. And I can sit down with Greg or Nick um, or maybe you someday over a few beers and go, hey, let's, you know, let's hash it out. The truth is, you know, we're just we're really just a bunch of guys having fun right. with something that we're interested in, but that none of us really understand. I absolutely agree. And actually, uh, I had talked to Greg one time about it, and I said that uh, in a lot of ways, it's it's Star Wars fans arguing with Star Trek fans over which one is better. And most normal people are outside saying, well, you're both nerds, so it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Or you're geeks. Well, geeks, sure. And I've never understood the difference. Like, are geeks the D&D guys and the nerds are the Star Wars guys, or is it the other way around? Anyway, sorry, I'm off on a geeks versus nerds <laughs> thing. I use them interchangeably, so in my reality tunnel, they're the same thing, I guess. I don't. I, there must be a difference, but I don't really know. But the, the idea is that, it, I guess in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. But it, but it does to me, like you're saying, it, it gets me to exercise my mind and it and it keeps me from putting blinders on or, or or keeps me from putting myself into a box and saying well that's it this is how the world is let me seal it up and i'm good to go for the next you know hopefully fingers crossed 60 some odd years that i you know get to live here when i keep this interest in the the 40 and in the paranormal it reminds me that we really don't know as much as we may like to think that we do and and i'm okay with that you know, I, I like the mystery. I like the aspect of not knowing. And I, I enjoy the, like you said, the, the debates and, and the conversation. I talked my girlfriend's ear off before I had the blog because I didn't really have anybody in person to talk to. I would talk her ear off about it. And she was just sitting there, you know, kind of trying to stay awake because she was bored to tears. Because I find it just absolutely fascinating. Is Bigfoot coming out of a UFO to, to go smell up somebody's backyard? I, I don't know. Maybe. But let's talk about it because it's cool and, and interesting. That's that's going to be the title of this episode, by the way. Is Bigfoot coming out of a UFO to go smell up somebody's backyard? <laughs> With Tony Morrill. I used to do this too, I guess. I used to advocate for the scientific study of UFOs and all that. Blah. Now I just advocate for, hey, guys, let's have some fun and let's realize this is it's kind of like an imagination factory. And so don't get upset at somebody like Mac Tony's who's by his own admission with, say, the crypto terrestrials thing, doing a thought experiment. And I heard there were people who would write and say, this is this is heresy. And this is heresy to what? <laughs> to your own imagination <laughs> right. thought experiment? About extraterrestrials? Well, I, okay, I suppose in the same way that, you know, Protestantism was heresy to Catholicism 500 years ago. And that's kind of what it's like, Catholics arguing with Protestants over which version of Jesus is the right one. Well, you know, who knows? So, to me, it stimulates the imagination. And sure, there are a lot of weird people do it, you know, talking about the kind of, and by weird I mean crazy you know, potentially dangerous people. But there's a lot of crazy, potentially dangerous people talking about politics on Politico, too, So, which is a website dealing with politics. At least we're exercising our imagination. At least we're thinking about ourselves, the future, our past as well. And to me, and tell me if you agree or disagree, I come to the sort of belief that this is just another way that a group of human beings, and we're one group, there are others, can try and figure out who we are, what is our place in the universe, 
things like life after death. To me, it's all interrelated because it all comes back to sort of an existential thing where we're all trying to figure out, well, okay, what are we doing here? And who are we? And where have we been? And most importantly, where are we going? And uh, I think that's what we're doing with this sort of imagination tunnel. When I first started, I I was fairly confident that not only would all of these mysteries be solved within my lifetime, but that I would actually be the one to do it. Uh, you know, bear in mind, I was 10 years old, so you cut me a little bit of slack, but... Right before I get elected emperor of the universe, I'm going to solve all of the world's... Um... <laughs> actually, that was close, right? That was a close second was becoming ruler of the world, so we'll... Uh... But I, I don't believe that as much anymore, obviously. I, I firmly believe that when I, what is it, shuffle off this mortal coil... I won't be any closer to an answer than I am now at this point. And I'm okay with that because I think that it's the searching, it's it's the seeking out the answers, it's the it's the striving to find them that I have come to find most enjoyable. Um, I, I I think that if we were to solve the UFO thing tomorrow, I, I I'd be kind of disappointed. Um, until I found the new the next, you know, new mystery, because I don't I don't think we're ever gonna solve all mysteries ever. Um, but I, I think I would be a little disappointed because I kind of like the mystery. I kind of like the the debates and, uh, you know, looking at the different avenues that it could be. Because, you know, like you said, it's all a thought experiment. It's all a imagination factory. Is that is that it? I, I just enjoy exercising my brain. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's that even if you did solve, quote, quote, the UFO problem, say aliens land on the White House lawn and the aliens get out and they meet President Obama. And they say, Klaatu, Verata, Nictu, or whatever. Um, we're from Zeta Reticuli. And uh, we're here to tell you that some of those UFO cases that you know, you've seen, yeah, that, that was us, our bad. But we're also here to tell you, you know what? A lot of those UFO cases, that wasn't us. So we're not really here to talk to you or anything. We just wanted to come down and let you know, not us. And we checked with our other friends who are visiting you from other planets. That's not them either. So we don't know what that is. Anyway, nice talking to you. Um, good luck with your re-election and goodbye. <laughs> because right. even if you could say that some of them are definitively aliens <laughs> from Zeta Reticuli, which would be kind of cool, I think there's a lot of other sort of UFO cases out there that don't fit that mode. And I think the aliens would come down and the first thing they would tell us is, hey, we know more than you, but we know less than we'd like to. And so we're just a little further along on the searching, but... We don't know everything either. So don't ask us, you know, what, you know, we can tell you what the cure for cancer is, but we can't tell you whether there's a God or not. We don't know. We thought you knew. That's why we're here. I can imagine that, uh, you know, if we ever did make that contact, that they would also be dealing with cases of um, spontaneous alien combustion. And, you know, their, their adolescent girl aliens were also having manifestations of poltergeist phenomena that they don't understand either. I think that would be interesting to see if that's the case, you know, or maybe they're having people that are disappearing after they go walk around, you know, carriages and never, ever being seen again, just because they may be more superior than us. Like you said, they, they may not have all the answers. Sure. If we were to travel back in time, say, I don't know, 2000 years, and I picked that because I've been watching Spartacus on HBO lately. So let's say we travel back to Spartacus's time around 70 BC before the Roman Empire. They would look at us like gods. They would say, you can fly in these contraptions, but frankly, if you put a jetpack on, you can literally fly. Or if you're Greg Bishop, you can be in your little flying machine. So it would look like you would have wings. So you could show up in a paraglider, look like you have wings that go, wow, you could pull out a gun and just kill someone apparently by thought, by pointing your hand with this strange device attached to it. Boom, he's dead. And all these other things we could do, we'd have these iPads that could play music and stuff, assuming they would work in the ancient world. And let's just assume that they would. <laughs> and they would go, well, you clearly are superior to us. You are, you are Zeus, you are Apollo, you must know the answers to everything. So is there life after death? And we would look at them and go, I don't know. But I, I, I can play Kid Rock on my iPad. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that um, is awesomeness. But you do not know whatever, Veni Vidi Vici, whatever the Latin is for, is there a God? Que estor gado avec aujourd'hui vous crayon. I don't know. I just mixed eight languages in there. Uwagadugu. And yeah, no, we don't know. We don't know. Well, you know, how can you not know? You're so technologically advanced. Well, that's the thing. We're more advanced, but we're not at the end of the road yet. And I think if we do run into aliens, 
that that might be part of it. You know, my takeaway is that if we're ever to somehow communicate with God, I don't think he's going to have all the answers either. And that's going to be the really bummy thing about it, you know what I mean? He's going to be this super advanced thing, but he's also not going to understand, you know, what the question to the meaning of life is. I mean, he'll know the answer 42, everybody does, but he won't know what the question is. Well, if I came face to face with God, I'd go, all right, I, you're like the Sphinx. I have one question. Yes, what is it? <laughs> Where did you come from? Right, no, exactly, yeah. I mean, really, seriously, before, you know, who was here before God? Like, who created you? I get that you created us. I'm good with that. <laughs> who created you? Um, look at the time. Uh, I've got a planet to create and a little more work to do in the platypus. Um, I've got to be going. Uh, Jesus, can you take this one? Oh, uh, yeah, no, but that's... that. It wouldn't surprise me if that happens. You know, I, I, I think that um, everything, if, if there is other sentient life out there, and I... I really hope that there is. I think we're all seeking for those greater, that greater understanding. You know, we're all searching for, quote unquote, the truth, whatever that may mean. You know, even if you have to, at the end, just find the meaning for yourself. I came up with a motto a couple of years ago, where, uh, which I use now, where I basically just say the journey is the destination. I mean, everyone looks and said, hey, where are we going? You know, we, we have to get to this place. And I go, I don't know where I'm going. All I know is that the destination is the journey. Every day I wake up, it's, um, you know, that's my destination. And it's the travel part, whether it's literally traveling from place A to place B or wandering around Scotland or whatever, whether it's the sort of, met, sort of more metaphorical traveling, which all sounds very new agey. And it drives people nuts who are more of the nuts and bolts type. They go, what are you talking about? Yeah. We know where we're going, and they're coming here, and they landed at Roswell, and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. So let's get away from all the New Agey stuff, and let's close it out with a couple of quick snappers. It's an old Reach for the Top game show thing where they would ask quick questions with quick answers. Ooh, fun. Okay. Ding! There's the bell. <laughs> We've talked a lot about UFOs, but... Give me your quick take on Bigfoot, because I've seen you write about Bigfoot before, and you seem interested in Bigfoot. So what do you think about Bigfoot? I find the idea that there's a, a giant uh, ape living in at least, you know, the northwestern United States. Um, you know, maybe Yeti and Yowie and stuff like that, but certainly within the United States at least. I, I find that a little bit hard to wrap my mind around, and, and especially a lot of the interactions with Bigfoot. There's a lot of the, oh, you know, Bigfoot disappeared before my eyes and that kind of thing. For all I know, he, he may just be popping in accidentally from somewhere that's just happens to be just close enough to us, a, a dimension that just every now and then kind of overlaps and, and you know, there he is. Uh, I don't rule out that there's a, you know, giant hominids running around the planet. I just, I don't know that we've seen enough evidence for that yet. So if I had to, you know, put a pin in it somewhere, I would say right now, yeah, interdimensional Bigfoot. I like that. You use the term, I wouldn't rule it out. Let me ask you this. Is there anything in sort of the paranormal world that you've come across that you would rule out, that you just go, you know what? No, that, that doesn't make any sense. Apparently, I do that a lot more than I think I do. Um, my gut reaction to a lot of it seems to be, I just don't think that that's what's going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, if I had to pick an example, I would say, uh, oh boy, that's a tough one. I'm thinking a lot of abduction. I, I know we we're off of that, but I mean a lot of abduction accounts. I'm just like, mm, I don't think that that's necessarily what's going on. We may be dealing with sleep paralysis here, or really vivid dreams. You know, most of these encounters that people have with with stuff, I just have to wonder sometimes. Um, the Bermuda Triangle actually is another one that I'm not. At least the more mystical aspects of it. I'm fascinated by the idea that there may be bubbles of methane gas or whatever that literally cause you know lift to go away under an airplane or under a you know buoyancy under a ship to go away and they they sink to the bottom that's kind of cool but the the idea that there's some kind of a hole in reality that these ships are falling into i just i don't know maybe but i i doubt it it's cool unless you're in one of those ships <laughs> exactly you know your last thought is hey this is kind of cool i can't wait to get home and tell my wife about this amazing disco oh crap you know, so I'm not going home. Damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so here's another short snapper for you. What is the creepiest animal alive? Because I'm on your blog right now. You have a picture in a post that you put up. Let me check here. Uh, hold on. 
Tuesday, May 1st, little green meme, which is clever. And you have a picture of an owl. Yeah. I find owls creepy. Like the freaky little animals that their eyes look at you and it's like, what the hell is that thing thinking? And then you realize they have giant claws. And then I know what they're thinking. So, and crows freak me out too. Don't ask me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I saw one attack a cat out in my backyard the other day. It's like, not my cat. I don't have a cat. But there was this cat walking around. And a crow just landed on it and started, bah! and I thought, wow, I thought the cats were at the top of the food chain vis-a-vis birds. But apparently not. So what what animal freaks you out the most? Which is apropos of nothing, but it, I'm just curious. It's 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 oh, well, don't laugh. Uh, it's a rabbit. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help but laughing. I, I know, it, and it, it doesn't even have to necessarily be a particularly big rabbit. Uh, it's the combination of the teeth and the ears and the hopping and the tail. I I, I don't know what it is. It just there's there's a movie where these rabbits are somehow irradiated and become giant and eat people. I don't know the name of it, but I saw it as a young child, and I think it scarred me for life. I, I cannot deal with with rabbits, which uh, is kind of terrible because I live in an area that's a little bit more rural where we have rabbits that run across people's yards, and it freaks me out. I, I kind of squeal like a little girl. I, I feel very uh, emasculated when it happens. Okay, you might be the only person on the planet that would be emasculated by little bunny rabbits. That's... Um... That's 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 yeah. but that's cool. That's the kind of crazy geek versus nerd coolness that we like to drill down to here on the other side of truth or whatever the new name of the show is going to be. Apropos of nothing. Right, exactly. Here on Apropos <laughs> of Nothing. That would be the perfect topic. I that's it, a new segment called and now Apropos of Nothing. Tony, um the animal that freaks you out the most. Uh, rabbits. <laughs> okay, that's Apropos of Nothing. <laughs> See, I grew up reading Watership Down. I love rabbits. Um, I wouldn't uh, want to have one, but to me, they're they're almost human-like because in Watership Down, they're basically humans um, acting as we would. So if you had to be on a six-hour-long plane flight and you had to sit next to somebody, would you rather sit next to Jessica Alba or Greg Bishop? Greg Bishop, actually. I feel like I'd be terribly inappropriate. Well, I'd probably be inappropriate with both, but I don't think that Greg would necessarily file a restraining order or take me to jail over it, whereas Alba may. All right, fair enough. Let's say you're on a plane with Greg Bishop and Jessica Alba. The plane crashes on a desert island, and only two of the three, everyone else dies, but of the three of you, two can survive and one joins the dead people. Who would you rather have on the desert island surviving with you? Well, that's an entirely different scenario. Uh, sorry, Greg Bishop, but it would have to be Jessica Alba. All right, fair enough. Th- those are two pretty good answers. I-, I would agree. If I had to talk to someone for six hours, Greg, Desert Island, yeah, sorry. Your shark food, Bishop. Yeah. Um, I'm, taking, I'm taking Jessica Alba. Because for all I know, our plane going down, everybody else died in the world, too. Maybe it's part of some giant Armageddon Holocaust kind of thing. And Jessica and I are the only two people left to repopulate the human race. I'm with you, and I don't think it would take very long for me to convince her that that's the case. So I thought you were going to say, I don't think it, take, it would take very long for us to repopulate the human race. <laughs> Back to the rabbits again. Yes. Um. <laughs> so we've, we've decided that in certain circumstances, you'll pick Greg Bishop over Jessica Alba. You're really afraid of rabbits. Yes. And you Bigfoot, you're not, you don't think it's a real creature. You're probably leaning towards it being perhaps some sort of thing that comes through a portal. One final question, because I'm looking at your picture and I'm not going to say you're bald, but it looks like you kind of shave your head. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Do you draw your inspiration from the late Mac Tonys or from Nick Redfern (laughs) or from somebody else entirely? Uh, Somebody else entirely. I can't do anything. This is the girliest I'm going to sound, I think, ever. I can't do anything with my hair, so I can't style it. I can't... uh, it's just a mess, you know, getting up in the mornings, having to put my curlers in and everything. So I, I typically tend to just shave it just to save time. So Fair enough. Although, you know what? You're afraid of rabbits. So I'm pretty sure that that last answer was not the girliest you could sound. You've already crossed that Rubicon, my friend. All right. So there you go, then. Yeah, I can't do anything with it. It's a mess. So I shave it. You could be wearing pink shoes and have a ballet dress on. And I'd go, yeah, you know what? Uh, you're afraid of rabbits. This is a step up. Afraid of rabbits. I just, oh, wow, crazy. No, you're not afraid of them. 
they are this the creepiest animals you know apparently. it is a combination of the two though it is it, they're creepy and i am also afraid of them so i'm not sure if that helps my case or not but no not really <laughs> leaving the apropos of nothing thing the last thing i'm going to ask you about is because i have done ghost investigating if you will what do you make of the whole ghost thing? Are you interested in ghosts? Does it um, float your ghostly boat as it will? And if it does, uh, what's your take on on the ghost phenomenon? I am very interested in ghosts. I don't... I guess it's just my nature at this point now. I, I don't know that they're the spirits of the, the deceased. I do feel that there is something going on that seems to not be corporeal. But I like the idea of maybe time slips. That seems like an interesting aspect of the phenomena that I don't think a lot of people look at, where not only are we maybe slipping backwards in time, but perhaps what we're encountering are people that have accidentally slipped forward in time. Because, you know, time doesn't, it's certainly not what we perceive it to be. We know that, I think, pretty confidently. And so perhaps, you know, when you had those two ladies, uh, I think it was in France, where they walked in the courtyard and suddenly it was, you know, uh, 1800 France or something to that effect. Maybe they were genuinely in 1800 France for just a few minutes by some weird process that we don't really understand. You know, vice versa, if you're in a quote unquote haunted house and you're seeing this ghost of a lady who, who died a hundred years ago, maybe somehow you are literally perceiving her from a hundred years ago when she was alive. And maybe she went and wrote down in her diary, I saw, you know, a strange clothed man, and that was you. I always thought it would be interesting to go back and look at people's journals to see if maybe they encountered us from the future. It's it's interesting because maybe the accounts that we see of so-called UFO knots, if you will, really is that kind of thing that we're seeing, not echoes, but folks from the future and not literally showing up on our doorstep via time travel the way we might think of it in a time machine but sort of a portal opening that gives us a view of what the future might be. We see them, they see us kind of thing. Right. And there's that, uh, what is it, the thing that the ancient astronaut people always pull out, that little figurine that looks like a DC, whatever it is, the, the airplane? Maybe that's what happened. Maybe, you know, on a layover from Los Angeles to New York, the plane accidentally slipped back, a, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, and the ancients saw it and made a figurine out of it, thinking it was a god of some kind. I, I don't know. You know, I can't say that that didn't happen. As with the UFO equals aliens, the ghost equaling deceased human spirits thing is, is a little too cut and dry for my taste. We can't say that's not happening, but I, I, I don't think it hurts to entertain other ideas. Absolutely. Like, as with the Star Trek versus Star Wars thing or whatever, it's all grist for the imagination factory. Could you really have a factory for imagination? You know, little worker drones, bing, 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 bing. Here, here's your imagination for today. Bing, 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 bing. And the sound bing, bing, bing is them hammering on metal. You know, what's funny is I can I can imagine the imagination factory, but I'm not sure how well it would be to realize it. Imagining the imagination factory. I like that. Cool. Well, we're almost at the hour and a half mark, which even after I edit it down is as much as I'm willing to subject anybody to of me if, you know, you're fine, but... Nobody wants to listen to me for an hour and a half. Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to tell people uh, before not, you know, like the eight people who listen to this, to this quote show? <laughs> uh, I blog. Uh, like you said, I, I guess you're going to have links up to that and stuff. I, I do blog occasionally. Um, they can go and read it. I don't know why you would, but you can. Um, I do, however, write for Tim Benall's Been All of America, um, which you don't necessarily have to go read my blog my articles, but you can certainly go check out his podcast. I'm plugging Tim now. That's right. I forgot to mention the first thing that you really did in all of this was you started writing for Benal's website, right? That is correct. Uh, I was thinking about that the other day. Had he, you know, turned down and rightly so my articles that I initially sent to him, uh, I don't think I would have started blogging. I would have just kept my craziness to myself, which may have been, you know, for the better of everyone else. But you know what? I do have one last question for you. I swear this is the last question. Who are your influences? I should have asked this right off the top. Like, you know, you, your mom let you read all this stuff. But, you know, who has kind of influenced where your thinking has gone? That should have been the first question. But as it turns out, apropos of nothing, it's the last question. I think it's a good last question, actually. Um, you know them all. It's uh, Greg Bishop in a lot of ways, Nick Redfern in a lot of ways, um, Mac Tonys, yourself, 
Um, and then the bigger names, you know, Jacques Vallée and John Keel, those kind of guys. It, it all started because of Tim Benal. That's how I got introduced to each of you being interviewed on him or being discussed on his show. And then, you know, through Radio Mysterioso, I learned of other people. But but those are probably the biggest influences on the way I look at this thing for better or for worse. So You had me right up until you listed all of our names off and then said, or bigger names, like, you know. <laughs> And admittedly, they're bigger names. I don't, I don't aspire to be a big name in anything. No, I, but um, you know, I'm hurt now. No, what I'm, actually? I'm just. <laughs> you're gonna get a box full of rabbits in, by <laughs> FedEx you. on Monday. Thank you. But no, actually, uh, you have yourself to blame, I guess, for a lot of this because it seems like uh, after you and I first corresponded on Twitter, my blog just went to crazy heights that I never thought it would go. Um, so I guess you have yourself to to thank or blame for that. You know, you helped introduce me to a lot of these people and stuff like that. And you were actually a big help and a big inspiration. A lot of the early comments that you gave on my posts and stuff like that, you, you know, gave me the impetus to continue. So, no, I like your writing. Um, and uh, I'm always happy to introduce folks. I introduced Matt to uh, Greg. I think I introduced him to Nick, too, or vice versa. And, you know, that's, you just sort of, I found Mac reading UFO updates. Back when I was doing the Stan Friedman film, I joined Updates in 2000 and 2001, and he was posting there. He's very young. And, you know, you just read and you go like, hey, look, there, there might be 100 guys here, 98 of whom I, I'm just not interested in. But you, I don't even know who you are, but this Mac Tony's guy, the way you write, what you're talking about, yeah, you sound interesting. So we just started corresponding, and the next thing you know, we got a chance to meet in person. But that's sort of the wonderful thing about the Internet is and I know a lot of people have said oh, the internet has killed UFO conferences and all that and it has it's had a detrimental effect on attendance but on the other hand it's opened up the ability to communicate between people that otherwise wouldn't have had that opportunity before so I think it's it's good and that's you know kind of how we've met quote quote and how we've all sort of gotten to know each other yeah I, I can't imagine uh, how we would have without the internet I mean there's there's I can't imagine how it would have happened, you know. Thanks very much, Tony. It's been great talking to you. We'll have to do it again sometime. Yes, definitely. Thank you a lot, Paul.